In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk all about training your abs and your core and using minimal equipment. So we talk all about the the the, the factors that contribute to a very effective core workout. Like how do you get these muscles to develop so that they're more visible? How do you make them more aesthetic? What rep ranges you should train in? Like how frequent you should train? We talk about a lot of the common pitfalls and mistakes. We talk about some of our favorite, favorite exercises. We think you're going to love this episode, especially if you really want to place special focus on developing the muscles of your midsection. Now, before the episode starts, I want to let you know that we do have a core training program. It's actually one of the original programs uh, that we ever sold at Mind Pump. In fact, if you enroll in the program, you get to see 2014 Sal version. This is an old program I created, still extremely effective. It was actually filmed in my old personal training studio. This is before Mind Pump ever became a thing. Um, and because right now everybody's stuck at home and because we're doing this episode, we're going to put this program at 50% off. That means it only costs, it's a full workout program for the core. That only makes this program $28.50. Here's how you get that program. Go to no BS six pack.com. So that's N O B S the number six P A C K.com. And then use the code no BS 50 for the half off. So that's N O B S and the number five zero no space for that discount. You know, speaking of feeding Sal's uh, ego. Oh, I like this. Yeah, I know. Bill Burr, here? Just pumping your tires. <laughs> do we day. need to do that? I know. Yeah, no. we, we don't actually, but uh, here, I do need, I think we should talk about this because one, I for, I forget a lot of times. Uh, you know, we we feel like we talk about something uh, at nauseum sometimes, and then what, what I, I catch us doing is, you know, after we've talked about it so much, we are, okay, we move away from it, then we don't discuss it, kind of forget, uh, yeah, and kind of forget yeah. about it uh, how important it is. And I was reminded of of this, and I actually wanted to uh, to to actually open it up with Sal, kind of sharing a little bit of the origin story of it. And I was getting, I got been getting obviously lots of messages about people that are at home and things to do. And, you know, one of the, one of the people that messaged me just literally yesterday was asking about, Hey, do you know any like really good ab programs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I got a laugh. I was like, Oh yeah. shit. I was like, you know, when we first started the podcast, we talked so much about this. And a lot of that is one, uh, at that time we only had anabolic and no BS six pack abs. And uh, I thought that, okay, we've talked so much about it. I think we've beaten that that, mm -hmm. that dead horse. But yeah. the reality is we haven't visited the kind of ab conversation in a long time. And I thought, you know, what, what, what a, when, when would we be a better time to discuss a, an at-home program uh, that doesn't really require much uh, weights at all to perform? And I want to start off first, though, before we get into it, is actually – you sharing Sal because the the kind of the origin story of No BS Six Pack Abs is really cool, and uh, it was also around the time you and I were first kind of meeting and talking. And I remember uh, looking into this. This was also you know I looked at anabolic and I looked at No BS Six Pack Abs, and this was part of the the brilliance uh, of again pumping your tires mm. of of you and what made like, me. Ooh, I'm just gonna bake it. <laughs> is, is what sold oh. me. It really did. It's what sold me on. Okay, I got. I've got to meet this guy and we got to talk because he definitely he he definitely gets it on another level that most people don't. Uh, and, and so you have to share with the audience when, when, how you created, why you created it. And then let's, let's break down some mm. of the philosophies behind it. Yeah. I mean, there, there, I mean, you guys know this just as well as I do. We've all been doing this a long time that there's a lot of, of myth and what would be considered common knowledge in the fitness space that surrounds yeah. muscle building and training and fat loss and some of this stuff, when you get into the space, you become a trainer, you figure out, oh, this is totally false. Some of it lingers for a very, very long time. Some of it is so pervasive that you accept it as truth until later on, maybe sometimes years later. It actually took me 10 years to figure out a lot of the stuff that I thought was true about ab training mm. uh, was totally false. So up until this point, some of the stuff that I had thought was, you know, the way you trained abs was, you know, with really high reps and really, you know, it's about getting lean. And if you get lean enough, everybody has a six pack. There's definitely some truth to this. This is what makes a lot of this common knowledge uh, kind of myth stuff so hard to 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 see through is that it's kind of based in some truth. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Uh, every single person 
has a six pack if you peel off every layer of body fat. There's definitely that's the shape of the abs. It looks like there's six blocks or eight blocks or four depending on your genetics, but there's definitely muscles there if you were to peel all the body fat back. And so I'd been training for, you know, a long time. You know, everybody knows the story, right? I started working out at 14, became a pro a professional trainer at 18, and you know, having a midsection that was impressive was always something that was something that I was after, mainly because it was something that people valued. Like, if you're at the beach or you take your shirt off, if you want to really look impressive, one of the most impressive things, one of the things that anybody will will look at and, and admire is a well-defined, you know, strong-looking midsection. Well, you remember that stat that you brought up not that long ago that I thought was hilarious that I'd never heard before, that there are there's more millionaires... In the, in the world than there are people that have six pack abs. True, right? yeah. <laughs> I think it's, that's yeah. hilarious. It, it is crazy. It actually highlights how hard it is to right, uh, right to get yeah. to this. Obviously, it's not easy to become a millionaire. That's right, and and again, if you're you know if the average person is looking at you, let's say you're at the beach and you're a guy and you take your shirt off, you know someone who trains might look at you and be like, wow, I could see he's got really developed de- delts and look at his back and his chest and all that stuff. But the average, average person, they look at your midsection. If you yeah. have a six-pack, you're fit. Like, it's the most impressive like the thing. the gold standard. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's interesting that we've strayed away from, you know, ab conversations as much because that's the most high search term that you could possibly, you know, search in in regard to fitness because that, that tends to just be this, it's, it's like a benchmark, sort of the epitome of when I got fit was when I had a six-pack is oh, what people think. Totally. And so at the time, you know, I thought, oh, I just got to get shredded enough and do all these high reps and maybe don't train my core that much because I'm deadlifting and squatting. And so up until this point, in order for me to get like a a visible six pack, I personally, and this is a little different from person to person, but I had to get like eight to 7% body fat. Now, most guys, they say will have a six pack at around 10%. I had to get down to about seven, 8%. And they weren't really visible when I was relaxed. And I really uh, admired when when dudes would have abs that you could just see all the time. They didn't have to flex them. They could just walk around and they had like these brick abs that would kind of stick through. So I was always searching for that. Well, anyway, as I got deeper and deeper into uh, personal training and as I started to study workout techniques of, you know, the old time bodybuilders and strength athletes, like way before anabolic steroids were ever a big thing. And by the way, if you examine the workout routines of bodybuilders and strength athletes, you can clearly see the influence of anabolic steroids. Clearly, the training routines totally changed. Body part split routines were not popular until anabolic steroids became a big thing. Before that, everybody trained kind of full body, focused on compound movements and all that stuff. So you could clearly see that. So I was studying these kind of old routines, and I started to kind of think to myself and say, you know, why why are we told to train the abs differently than any other muscle? Like, do they not build? Don't they build like the biceps or the delts or anything else? And then I also started to really look at the function of the, the muscles of the midsection. And what's true for any muscle is this. If you train a muscle through a full range of motion, through its what it's supposed to do, you're going to get better results than if you train it in a partial range of motion. And you'll get better results than if you train it in just a static tension range of motion. Mm-hmm. Now, all of those produce some kind of result, by the way. But the one that builds the most muscle and produces the best results is always kind of that full range of motion. So then what I started to do is I started to train and experiment with myself. And then I started to experience certain changes. I was focusing on really full ranges of motion. I started using resistance. I started thinking of working my core the same way I thought of working my shoulders or my back or my chest or my arms. I thought to myself, why don't I build Mm -hmm. these muscles? Because I know what's true for the legs and arms and chest and back, which is this. If you have more muscle, you don't have to look as lean to see the same definition. You just don't. If you have a muscular, you know, muscular biceps and triceps, your arms look leaner at higher body fat percentages. This is totally true. The same thing should be true for the midsection. And so I went on this, 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 I embarked on this journey of building the muscles of my core. And then this is how I developed the, the, the program, the no BS six pack formula. Now my abs used to be a body part where again, you couldn't see them until I was seven or 8% body fat. I got them built to the point where at 10% body fat, not only could you see them when I flexed them, you could see them when they were relaxed. You could even see them through my shirt. If I had a tight shirt on, people would comment on my abs. And it was 
it was a massive complete transformation, and that's when I came up with the program, the No BS Six Pack Formula. Now, when when you talk about full range of motion, though, you also have to explain to people the function of it because I think that's that's where a lot of my clients struggled was really understanding the function of the abs and how to because if you don't understand the function, it's hard to understand how to take that through full range of motion. Totally, it's not as simple as. You know, oh, when I I squat, I take my legs by going all the way down. I take it through full range of motion. It's so much easier for people to visually see that, or a bicep curl going all the way open to all the way close. Totally. The abs are a little more complex, and so I think you got to explain first to people like really the 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 complete function of the abs, and then also maybe the the mistakes that people make when they do and that. Which muscles tend to get in the way of that? Oh, totally. I think people, the average person, thinks if you fold your body. That that's abs, right? So if I if I'm laying on the floor and I sit up, or if I bring my legs closer to my body, that I am working my abs through a full range of motion. That's not um, necessarily true. Now all muscles, when they contract, they bring both attachment points closer together. So think of like a, a rubber band attached at two points. If that rubber band shrinks, it just pulls the two points closer together. Well, the attachment points of the of the abs, for example, really are the, the pelvis and the lower rib cage. So think of your pelvis, think of your lower rib cage. When the abs contract, they bring those two parts closer together, not your legs to your body or your upper body down to your legs. That's part of it. And so what ends up, and now what does that? Hip flexors. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to explain too that, okay, if the hip flexors are what responsible to that, what do we know about most people? Oh, tight and strong hip flexors. Yeah. Right. Because we sit all day long, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. And we walk. We at yeah. least walk, which is a lot of hip flexor you know, activation. And remember, the hip flexors, so here's what's interesting, by the way. Is so if this is you, this is exactly what's happening. If you find that your lower back starts to get tight and you start to feel pain whenever you work your abs... That's because you are hammering your hip flexors. The hip flexors, one, one muscle in particular, the, the psoas muscle, attaches at the thigh, goes through the body, and then attaches at the lower part of the spine. So when you're doing leg raises or sit-ups and you're not really working the abs through a full range of motion, what well, you're going to feel it is in the hip flexor. And oftentimes, it's not in the hip that you'll feel it. It's at the attachment, which is the lower back. So you start to get like, oh, I can't do... How many times have you had clients say this? I can't do leg raises. When I do, it hurts my lower back. Right. right. That's not because your back is bad. It's because your hip flexors are doing all the work and your midsection, your core, your abs in particular, are not. So what's the full range of motion for the abs? Full range of motion for the abs is lumbar flexion and extension. So it's bending at the lower back not at the hips. So imagine a waiter, like an old school waiter, bending forward with a really, really straight back to bow, right? Yeah. That's that's hip. Hips. That's your hips. Yeah. That's hip hinging. hinging yeah. Right. Now imagine somebody, imagine you're laying on the floor and pretend like you're a piece of paper rolling that's up. I love slowly. to use the term rolling up. Like it, yeah. I think that's where, I, that's why I don't like sit up. Sit up is too too simple, and I think that's where people go wrong is they think about sitting their body weight up and you just do whatever it you takes. You think momentum, like I'm trying to propel my upper body forward when in fact I'm trying to actually like roll forward and get my sternum close to my belly button. This totally. Is, this is why I like the perfect sit up so much in teaching that because you're really trying to teach a client to understand how to, you you're, you can roll your vertebrae up. Yes, you can, yeah. You can roll the vertebrae, like you say, we twist it up with a, a paper, and if you kind of think of that visually of what you're trying to do versus just trying to get the body up. Mm -hmm. It makes a world of a difference just thinking of it like that. Oh, it's huge. And, and how hard is it? You take somebody, I've done this so many times. I'll take a client and, they'll, and I'll say, oh, do you work your core? Oh yeah, that's what I work all the time. I can do, you know, 50 you know, 50 sit-ups or 50 sit-ups on a physio ball. And say, yeah. okay. I could hold a plank for like five minutes. Yeah. And I'll say, okay, well, let's try let's try doing them, but I'm going to watch your form. And then I'll change their form and have them focus on rolling up. And they go from doing 50 to doing five. Because now, they're because here's what happens when you do a sit up or a leg raise with all hip flexors, you'll feel it in your abs too because your abs are stabilizing. Mm -hmm. So they are stabilizing, but you're not working them through a full range of motion. The muscles you're working through a full range of motion are your hip flexors. The worst exercise for this, by the way, leg raises. Leg raises, almost nobody does them right. Nobody. When you watch someone do leg raises, all they're doing is bringing their knees up. Swinging their legs up. Yeah, and, and really what you should do if you want to do a proper leg raise, and I teach this in that in that program, 
is you do bring the legs up, but you curl. Yeah. You curl the hips under your body. It's like you're tucking you tuck your tailbone. It, yeah, you tuck your tailbone up, so you still kind of propel yourself up with the glutes kind of squeezing. Super hard, but re- and it's a it's a high resistance exercise, but it really builds the abs only when you do them properly. When you do them wrong, you're just going to get super tight. Well, this flexors. is why too. I think you. I think it's important that you learn how to do a just a laying flat on the ground, really good reverse crunch. Yes. Before mm-hmm. you progress to a, a le- uh, like a. You got to learn the technique first. Yeah. If you, you have to first, le- I mean, we talk about this all the time. We just you know came off of a month of talking a lot about mobility and the neurological connection. That's part of this problem here is mm-hmm. that you have a really poor connection to your abdominals, especially that that first initial roll up, and so. Getting people to understand that it's more of that. It's less of a, you know, do you have abs or not have? Are you really connected well and understand how to articulate the movement, learning to practice that and get really connected to it before you start to progress to all these other movements? Oh, I remember you guys remember years ago when I did that post on how to do a plank so that it works your abs? Yeah. And everybody lost their minds. Oh, yeah. yeah. All physical therapists lost their minds. Everybody. Because when you do a plank, you see this kind of straight back or maybe slow, small arch in the low back. And that's fine. You're using some core, using a lot of hip flexors. But if you do a plank and you tuck your tailbone, like you drop your tailbone, squeeze your core like you're doing a crunch, yeah. now hold that. Yeah. Totally different exercise. Yeah. There's no way you can't feel your abs. No, that's what you're doing. You're yeah. squeezing your abs and supporting yourself with your I abs. I remember when I learned that, I never again taught a standard plank. Yep. Because I realized how- Yeah, where's the nine value? Out, nine out of 10 times, you're working with people up to hip flexor problems. 100%. Yep, yep. The other issue that I that, that I think uh, comes up with, with core training is, and this is a kind of a trend that I think is silly, which is- not really training the obliques. You know, everybody wants to work the abs. Right. Nobody wants to train the obliques. I think that's such a big mistake. Yeah, I mean, come on. Like, and I know this is probably influenced a lot by like presenting yourself on stage and there's this sort of value of having this this uh you, you know, this tiny waist and so like building building the obliques to a lot of people seems like it's going to make them look a little more square, but in fact, it really helps to kind of highlight the development of the entire core. Well, it's it's kind of ironic that people don't when if you ask somebody, but you it like layman's term explained to me like if I asked like Katrina like what's your favorite part about when my, when my abs are ripped, we like Oh, I know. She what do they say? They say, "Oh, that V." <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. that V. Well, what creates that V and exaggerates that V more than anything else is pronounced obliques. Totally. Yep. So one of the best things that you can do to develop that look or create that illusion of having an even deeper V or more pronounced abs is also by developing the obliques. Now, there, you know, CrossFit has brought a few things to the fitness space and some of them good, some of them bad. Here's one thing that I think is good. It's actually highlighted what functional good core muscles look like because when you see these CrossFit athletes that are shredded, and lots of people, women will say, oh my God, I want a midsection like that CrossFit athlete, or I want my midsection to look like that dude that won the, the games. Look at their cores. Their cores are built for competition. Yeah. And what you'll find is amazing abs, but also well-developed obliques. Yeah. It yeah, looks- Because they have to support their spine because all the load they're throwing on Yes, it well, looks amazing. And, yeah. and to that, I mean, I know we're, we're kind of talking a lot about the aesthetics, right? Because I know that's what appeals to most people. But the truth is, as trainers- we know the the function of that and the importance of that, especially, I mean, I was just talking to a, a client of mine and, you know, she went in and saw her chiropractor and is having uh, SI joint issues and mm. she was power washing for like four hours and that, and the, the chiropractor was explaining to her just like, oh, you have weak rotational strength. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, listen, this is the stuff. I said, this is why you pay me the big bucks. I said, I know you normally come to me and you were asking stuff about nutrition and looking a certain way. But when I get feedback from you like that, then I can give you exercises and movements to help support that. I mean, that's that's incredible information for me. And a really good coach hears that and goes, oh, wow. Now what I'll do and what I'll do in your workout today is incorporate some anti-rotational type movements or rotational type exercises or oblique specific stuff, which is going to help support that. And I would have to say that if... I think of a, a lot of things that uh, you know clients lack in as they age. It would be that rotational strength and stability. Dude, I, yeah. I'll, I'll say this right now: the oblique, all muscles are important on your body, but the obliques are are some of the most important for this reason right here. Okay, most people, even out of shape people, even people who don't work out, they at the very least walk. And I mean, I don't even mean walking for working out. They just have to walk, right? You walk from one place to another. Okay. 
Try this right now. If you're listening to this podcast and you have headphones on, try walking, but when your right leg goes up, moves forward, move your right arm with that right leg. <laughs> and when your left leg moves forward, move your, le your left arm with it. So rather than countering, because typically what happens if I step with yeah. my right, my left arm moves forward and same thing with my you left. You got to walk right. like a robot. You, you See how fast you yeah. can walk. See if you can run that way. It's terrible. You have zero control. You have no speed. Uh, it's you can't walk that way. You have this rotation that's natural in 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 humans, which we are you know the only animal we know of that walks on two legs. This is part of of why we're able to do that. Is we have that counter rotation with the upper body. It's what prevents us it promotes from, locomotion. It prevents us from spinning in place when we're trying to run and move, and that's obliques. Also, you just reminded me of some too. Oh, is for my athletes that are listening right now. This is a, a way I can always tell if you're a good performance coach. Uh, take a look at like Max Marzo. Uh, uh, Jay, uh, um, um, God, Corey Schlesinger, yeah, Corey Schlesinger, um, and then all, uh, Paul Fabritz, Paul right? Yeah, PJ, PJF Performance, right? If you look at, and, and literally, I was just on all their pages this last week. They're always popping up in my feed because I love their content. They all are athletic trainers, right, at the professional highest level. And look at the movements they're always teaching. They're always incorporate, incorporating that rotational power and strength mm -hmm. because of how it translates to athletes. So if you're an athlete listening to this and maybe you care maybe less about the benefits of looking like you have great abs, boy, the functional carryover into being performing and being a better athlete. And I can't think right now of a sport that doesn't need that. All you got to support your spine in multiple directions. You know, like life isn't just in front of us and behind us. So you got to start thinking outside of that. How can I support my body? How can I train my body uh, to be able to withstand a lot of these forces pulling me left to right? Uh, when I twist, you know, do I have the strength to be able to support my body in that twist? It is. And it's, it, it is what allows you to uh, utilize the strength of your limbs. If you have weak obliques, your legs and your arms cannot express their full uh, capacity, even if you do nothing but walk. Even if you just walk, like I just highlighted yeah. earlier, you have to have functional obliques. And from an aesthetic standpoint, okay, if you develop one nice-looking obliques with nice abs, even if your waist doesn't shrink, even if you have the same size waist, the illusion is going to look like you have a tighter, more amazing-looking midsection. So do not neglect the obliques. And I know most programs... Don't look at they look at the they play the obliques are like second fiddle they're not as important. You just reminded right. me of something else too, and I don't know how often you guys got this. I remember getting this a lot. I had many clients that the limiting factor of us getting a stronger deadlift and squat was due to having very co a weak core, weak obliques. Oh my god, oh, all the yeah. time. And I there was many times where I'd have a client who would hit a plateau in those two things. And we just maybe weren't putting a lot of emphasis on on ab training at that time. And I could see that. I could see that they were weak and stabilizing and supporting themselves as I was starting to increase load. So then I went back to the drawing board, incorporate a lot more training yeah. core and abs. All of a sudden, we see squat and deadlift. Oh, yeah, just think about that. I mean, if if you're pulling something up from the ground, uh, from, from your left arm, from your right arm, you're never going to have like perfectly even force distributed between my left and right side. So that that limiting factor being your if you have weak obliques that's that's there to stabilize you so you can stay rigid you can stay strong you can stay efficient as you're pulling that up so if you're not training that you know immediately that's a performance loss oh yeah anytime you do a press with dumbbells or a standing exercise or a row with one arm or two arms basically anytime you do anything, anything. involving your body you need to have a strong and stable core. The, another big uh, problem, a mistake that I saw, uh, and, and I still see this, is this weird myth that somehow the way you train the core is with really, really high reps. Like you, you mm. only ever do high reps. It's all those infomercials. Yeah, and it's terrible. And this this really boils down to the myth that you know high reps sculpts and shapes and tones, and low reps builds lots of bulk and size. And of course, who would like a big bulky midsection? Nobody, right? Everybody <laughs> wants a sculpted tight midsection, so I'm not going to do any high reps. Like, Here's a news flash, okay? Resistance training, the goal is always to build muscle, always. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get this massive midsection. And by the way, if you had, let's just say you were the one in a trillion people that could develop muscle like uh, Mr. Olympia, you still would not do a hard, heavy ab workout and wake up the next day and be like, oh no, I messed up. My, my midsection grew too much. It still doesn't happen that fast. The fastest way to get your midsection to look a particular way is to build those muscles. And high reps 
can build muscle just like low reps can, but if you only ever do high reps, it loses its value. This is one of my favorite to talk about because you know uh, I love sharing you know, paradigm shattering moments in our careers, and uh, this was an area that um, uh, I I fell victim to. I mean, I was the trainer who abs was kind of an afterthought. It was at the end of the workout. It's like how we finish something off and you'd mm -hmm. be doing, you know, a hundred bike yeah. abs or, you know, a bunch of, just yeah. a bunch of crazy sit-ups to kind of burn out at the end and, and feel them burn. And then, and I, if I remember correctly though, I think what fed into that, at least for me, is I remember reading something back then about the type of muscle fibers that you have yeah. in your abs and your calves mm -hmm. and that uh, high repetitions tend to, or they, they would say tend to be better for, for those reasons. Yeah. Right, that it, oh, they can handle. There's most slow twitch muscle fibers yeah. that they recover faster. And, and the yeah, the case they would make is you know the abs and calves are muscles that you're you're constantly using all day long, so right. they need high reps to respond they get to repetitive it. Repetitive stress. All and time. so I fell into this trap, and for many years I trained it that way myself and my clients. And I'll and I don't. I wish I remember what I read or what it was when I thought. You know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I've never tried. I've never lifted five reps on abs. Mm -hmm. Never rep did five reps on calves. And those two things were one of the most pivotal things that I ever did for both calves and abs was switch to doing really high or really low reps and heavy weight because I had been so focused on high reps and I saw this boost on both those areas right away. Yeah, so what it came from, and it's such a stupid myth, but what it came from is when they do analysis of different muscles, they can see... They'll, they can kind of do, you know, they do a biopsy and they'll look at the breakdown between fast twitch. And, by the way, this is a really, really rough generalization. It's more complicated than this, but they'll say, oh, okay, there's a ratio of, you know, two to one fast twitch to slow twitch or whatever. Fast twitch muscle fibers are the ones that produce power and strength, but they also burn out very quickly. So it's like a car with a V10. It's going to burn the gas very fast, but it's a lot of power and it goes quarter mile super fast. Slow twitch muscle fibers, they last longer. They're your endurance muscle fibers, but they burn energy much slower, and so they last longer as well. So it's like a car with a you know two-cylinder engine. It's like a Not, Prius. Yeah, yeah, you're going to go for much longer, but it ain't going to go that fast. Now, the fast twitch muscle fibers, they have the greatest propensity for growth because the bigger they get, the better they do their job. Slow twitch muscle fibers, now they can also grow, but they grow at a much, much lower and slower capacity because as they get bigger... They require more energy. And one of the things that you're asking your slow twitch muscle fibers to do is to have lots of staying power. So it doesn't make sense, for example, to have a two-cylinder car and say, I want it to go farther, so I'm going to make it a four-cylinder. It doesn't make any, any sense. What you want to do is make it more efficient. So the fast twitch muscle fibers grow, and this is why lifting weights makes your muscles build and why doing super long endurance type of stuff doesn't make your muscles build. It's why long-distance runners look the way they do and why sprinters look the way they do, okay? Now, what they do is they look at the, they do the muscle biopsies and they say, oh, abs have more slow twitch than than the than the delts, therefore train him slow twitch. Look, it doesn't matter. The, the fact remains, training fast twitch muscle fibers results in more building and more shape and more sculpting. Training in higher reps re results in more endurance and stamina. Now, high reps, again, to a certain point can still build, but if you stay there all the time, which is what people do, They'll do 20 reps for abs, and they only ever do 20 reps. They never play in the 10 rep or the 8 rep range, so they lose the effects that those could produce. I also think that the, it, what came with that, too, is just, you know, like our training certifications. Um, you know, they're, you're going you're gonna to lean on the safer route, almost, totally. right? Yep. And it's like, you know, if you take somebody who doesn't have good um, ab control— and then you load them with heavy weight. You wouldn't do that with any body part. Right. Yep. yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So then there, and especially if we know, like you brought up earlier about the psoas being attached to the low back and then what that can do as far as that can strain people. And they're all oh, like, every time I do abs, I feel it in my low back. And then you're sitting here telling me, Adam and Sal, that I should add load to that too. Not a good idea. So as trainers, you a lot of them started to, to I think lean on the, oh, well, let's do the safer route. I know yeah. I know my client's not going to throw her back out doing body weight crunches to 100, you know right, what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Where if I gave her, you know, 15-pound medicine ball and told her to do it slow and controlled for five, like maybe she'd be at risk more. No, but no, this does not negate the, the fact, this is true for all body parts, for all exercises, that form is extremely important. So if you, so I'll put it this way. 
let's say you do 50 reps on a physio ball uh, for crunches, which by the way, the physio ball is one of my favorite, favorite tools for working the core. Yeah. And I'll get into that. A it was bit. made for it. Oh, it's amazing for it. And I'll get into that uh, a little bit later. But let's say you do 50 reps on the physio ball and, and you do a bunch of crunches. And I want you to do high resistance. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to perfect your form and slow you down. And that's all I need to do. Usually, mm -hmm. I don't need to add weight. Now, adding weight, once you have the perfect form, then you can start to add resistance to your perfect form. But what I don't want, and I'm glad you brought this up, Adam, what you don't want to do is right now hang up on the, you know, you're done with this, this podcast and you go and add resistance. Yeah. How about you perfect your form, the range of motion, the squeeze, and what you may find is that your reps are low automatically because now you're doing the right thing with your form. Now, and when you get something we haven't touched on that, that it's also another great benefit and side effect and something I used to always present to clients on the importance of us training this and getting strong here is your core and your abs. This is your internal weight belt. Totally. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, you get really good at that and you know, you get strong in your core and abs. This is what helps prevent you from throwing your back out when you go over and you pick up a 50 pound, you know, bag of dog food, or you're doing something like that because you've put the work into really understanding how to control your abs. I mean, I know you guys do this because you're trainers. I try and teach my clients to do this. And when you, when you learn, okay, it starts first with the mind muscle connection, right? Working mm -hmm. at the, on the neurological level first. Once you learn and understand how to connect to the abs and activate them, then you 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 treat you you train that behavior. You make it a habit that any time I go to do something that could potentially compromise it, I always think my abs. Mm -hmm. Like I don't go pick a, a thing of dog food up and do it mindlessly. No, even you brace it, your core. Yeah, yeah even right. though I could deadlift four or five hundred pounds, it doesn't mean that I don't still brace my core even for fifty pounds. Yeah. it's a habit that I've taught myself. When I hinge over, I bend over, I grab something. Oh, just sitting down. Uh, yeah. for long periods of time is just to be conscious of that and like oh. your, your your posture. And then, like being able to, to to keep and brace that that position. So I want to reinforce like better positioning, and I could do that by focusing on like my abs uh, controlling that. You just reminded me of something else that I've been meaning to make a YouTube video on this for a long time, and I got to do make a note for this, Doug, because I need to do this. I've been wanting to shoot a YouTube video uh, of me sitting in my car and showing people. So, so I, I suffer from what a lot of people suffer from, which is like a, a, an anterior pelvic tilt. So my, my, it looks like my ass is kind of sticking out a little bit, which, you know, it, it can contracts the low back and my low back. It's the IG model pose. Right. And it That's can get, it. And, yeah, exactly. And it gets really tight. And there, there's two main factors from, or, or there's multiple factors, but two of the major things that's going on there is I'm in that position because I have a low, I have weak abs. I'm not training them as much as I should be, and addressing the imbalance of what, what like the hip flexors. Now, once once you understand how to connect, right, and the problem. So the problem is ass is sticking out too much. The opposite of fixing that is is squeezing the glutes and and actually activating and rotating the pelvis, right. You can do this in your car. You can do this on the plane. So a lot of times, I know there's people listening right now that can relate to this because this happened. You used to happen to me all the time. I sit in the car for a half hour, hour, or I'm on a plane for an hour, and oh, I get, and all I've been doing is sitting, and my low back is mm -hmm. just oh, yeah. that's and, where you feel it the most, right? It's it's because I'm I'm relaxed, mm -hmm. and but your I'm, hip flexors are sitting on the joints, tight. exactly, and I'm sitting on the joints, and my and it's stressing it so much. And something that I love to practice is you, know, I become aware of that, and while I'm driving, I'll squeeze the glutes. I'm, I'm doing it right now as we're talking, and I'll rotate the hips even in this position because I've done the work of understanding how to connect, I understand my issue and that I need to tuck that tailbone underneath it, I can create little ways of exercising mm -hmm. throughout the day to do that. And I tell you what, it's like how we talk about mobility and the importance of that. These are This is one of those things that this is even better than one 60-minute hard workout all day or one 60-minute workout a week of hard abs you'd be far better off understanding the function of the abs and then learning how to create these little behaviors. When you sit in your car, you activate and squeeze the glutes and, and, totally. and contract the abs and you're sitting on the plane. You do it when you're standing up watching your kids play sports yeah. instead of kind of slouch over. You can, you're you can do reinforcing that. reinforcing good patterns, good recruitment. Right. And, and this is what we're trying to stress because that's going to set you up for then, you know, being able to load the abs and being able to really build and develop them even further just like any other muscle. But it has to be promoting uh, the proper function. Yeah, what I like to tell people, because sometimes you tell people, brace your core, squeeze your core, and they almost don't know, like, what do you mean squeeze? Like, how do I do that? 
pretend like someone's about to tickle you or poke you in the stomach. Like, yeah. You kind of you brace it a little Punch bit. Punch you. Yeah. yeah, that's all. That's all you do. So you brace your core, and then you'll find you also all of a sudden have so much more stability in your low back. Because I think people forget that the spine, they think the back part of your body is what supports the spine, which is part of it. But it's the spine, is, it goes all the way around. Mm -hmm. So it's all the muscles that surround the spine that support it, including the lats, including the glutes. These muscles that are a little further also support the, the lower spine, but they all create that, that stability. But look, at the end of the day, if you want a midsection that's visible, if you want one that looks impressive, focus on building the muscles of your midsection, just like you would for your legs or your arms or your delts. Like, like I'll give you an example. Finally, it's taken a long time, but finally women have understood that if they want their butt to look good, they need to build it. For a long time, it was like, like, like what we're talking about for, for abs and core training, high reps and just got to get leaner. And it's like the glutes are a muscle. If you build them, your butt is going to look a lot better. And now they're starting to get that. You're seeing women squat and deadlift and Romanian deadlift and hip thrust, which is phenomenal. And people are developing amazing glutes. This is true for the midsection too. If you want a midsection that looks tight and impressive, even at higher body fat percentages, train them to build them. And what, but of course, perfect form and watch what happens. Here's another thing that I think a lot of people, I think people realize this part, but they do it wrong. The, the, you know, for a long time, we've been told to train abs frequently. Definitely some truth in that. I think that's true for all muscles. But there's another part that goes to that, which is if you train your midsection frequently, let's say three days a week or four days a week, it's important to manipulate the intensity. So what I mean by that is you're not going to train your abs you know, for an hour four days a week, super, super hard. Um, unless you are like the, the most fit core person in the world, that's just way too much. And just like that would burn out other parts of your body, it would not allow your midsection time to adapt and recover and build. So you do want to manipulate the intensity. So if you're working out really frequently with your midsection, some of the workouts should be higher intensity. Some of them should be lower intensity. And then if you really want to have fun and get your abs and your midsection to respond, throw in some trigger sessions for the midsection. Mm -hmm. This right here is an absolute game changer. So for people who don't know what a trigger session is, trigger sessions are low intensity, very frequent bouts of short bouts of exercise where all you're trying to do is feel the muscle work, get a little bit of a pump, and that's it. It's separate from your normal traditional workouts. It works for any body part. If I want my biceps to respond, I'll do some band curls three times a day on the days I'm not really hitting them in the gym and just get a little bit of a pump and I'll watch my biceps change very quickly. This is also true for the midsection. Well, that philosophy is very similar to what I'm talking about with just doing it. I mean, it's an isometric version of it, right? So yes. you, you're saying trigger in general. It, which, that's a trigger session. Right. It's, exactly. It's, 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 it's not me. I'm not, I don't get off the plane and I'm sweating and my abs aren't sore from that. It's just me connecting, connecting, mm -hmm. remind, reminding that, reminding my brain that this is where my body needs to be positioned. My abs are having to work, but it's not so intense that you know, the next day I'm going to be sore and I can't use yeah, them. It again. actually promotes recovery. Right. So then that way you go into like a, a more loaded, stressful type workout, mm -hmm. and you do this in between. I'm I'm recovering. I'm getting more blood flow. I'm getting uh, activity, but it's not at a high intensity where it's actually going to be damaging. It's going to be actually promoting a healing aspect. It actually sends a very small muscle building signal, which when you combine it with your traditional workouts, it amplifies the entire muscle building system. I mean. You see this. This is something that you witness in people that don't work out but that have jobs that require them to, to you know, use a body part very frequently. Look at, the, look at your mechanic's hands and forearms. Go find a mechanic who's been doing it for 20 years. Look at their forearms and hands. The rest of their body could be out of shape, and you'll notice very muscular-looking forearms. Look at the calves of mail carriers. I, this one, this is what blew me away. I, my, you know, my, when I was, my ex-wife's family has several male, male carriers in their family. And I noticed when it was summer and they'd wear shorts or whatever, every single, and they would be out of shape or whatever. Another, they don't train. They just deliver mail, but they're walking miles every day. Beautiful calves. And every single one of them yeah. had these really muscular calves. So that's kind of what trigger sessions do. Now, by themselves, you'll get a little bit something. But when you combine it with your traditional workouts, Boy, does that blow everything away. And when it comes to the midsection, if you're listening to this podcast and you're kind of getting your mind blown and you're like, okay, I want to see like how developed I could get my midsection in the next two to three months. Like you want to really put a turbo on it, throw in some trigger sessions and, and kind of watch what happens. But again, form is imperative for all body parts, especially for the midsection. 
One thing I want to get back to is the physio ball. And the reason why I want to get back to that is because the physio ball has this interesting curve of popularity in the fitness space. It got introduced in the late 90s, early 2000s, and everybody was like, wow, there's lots of benefit if I have my clients do shoulder presses on this or rows with the hand stabilizing or you know, whatever. They're getting great results. It's good for stability. It makes them okay. focus on their form. Let's use it for every exercise. And, and then it went crazy. Yeah. And then it was like, we're not using benches anymore. We're not using heavy barbells anymore. Let's stand on a physio ball and do weird stuff and one-legged you know, crazy stuff. And it just went way too far. So physio balls went from being super popular to just like nobody wants to use them anymore, which I think is stupid because somewhere in the middle is is their value. And, and some of their biggest value is for core training. Well, I, I'm glad you went this direction because, you know, early on we came out and actually talked a lot of shit about this type of training because it's it was the the quote unquote functional training. Yeah, it was that was abused like crazy. that went crazy. And and it, like many things, uh there's always exceptions to the rule and like many things in the fitness space, something that if we find out is good, we end up abusing or exaggerating. But that doesn't mean that it's not a phenomenal tool still. It's just how you utilize it. And I can't help but think, so I'm giving the analogy of the the, the lower cross syndrome. When I talk about uh, the anterior pelvic tilt, the, the, the sticking the ass out, the low back issues going on, um, the, the uh, lower cross syndrome is what that is, right? So that's, and it's so common that, you know, seven out of 10 people have some version of it and mm-hmm. some more more extreme than others. If you have low chronic back pain, more often than not, this is an issue. And when I would train clients, especially clients in advanced age, this was always an issue. Mm-hmm. And so here's an example how I love utilizing the physio ball. And you wouldn't even think, because it has nothing to do with that muscle group, but here's how a trainer can utilize this tool. I would love to teach a uh, a chest press yes. on a ball. and But here's the difference. I don't just put their upper back on there, and I'm not just focusing on the chest. I'm making them bridge. Yeah, the whole and, time. And, and what that bri- – so bridging is bringing their hips up. So they get on there. And by the way – this like would roast a client and they're doing their, they're doing a chest exercise, but then their, their glutes and their abs get roasted because they're having to stay bridged the entire time. Mm. So I'll get a client who is, you know, that we, we don't need to be doing really, really heavy weight because I'm still working on their mechanics to get better control with the bench, which here's where I love the stability ball. I put them on there. They're a little unstable, which forces them to slow down, be controlled with their form, also forces them to activate their core and their abs to stabilize. And then I get them to engage their hips, squeeze their butt and bridge up and keep that. So now I'm working on an issue that they have also all at the same time. Here is where the physio ball is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's excellent. I, I, it's okay. You know how you talk about the Z press a lot and how amazing it is for shoulder development mm-hmm. and how it built your shoulders. Yeah. The reason why the Z press was so, uh, why Adam loves it so much, why all of us enjoy it so much, is not because you're sitting on the floor. It's not. It has I, the floor plays a role, but there's nothing magic about the floor. But what it forces you to do is to have perfect form and get full extension. And all of a sudden your delts get this amazing activation. Physio balls can do that for a lot of different body parts, but here's why I love them for the core. When you're doing a sit-up or a crunch on the floor or a bench, they are flat. Mm -hmm. They're totally flat. Which your spine is not. Your spine, full range of motion for the abs goes from crunch, this is where the lumbar spine crunches forward, it flexes forward, right? But it also goes down to flat and then beyond where you get what's called full extension. You can't do that on other, you can't do that on the floor unless you put like a towel under your back and do also, but way harder. You can't do it on a bench, but if you do a proper physio ball crunch or sit up, proper, nobody does it right, but if you do it right, it is literally one of the most effective exercises yeah, you can do for Yeah, it, it complements that natural curve in, in your lower back like no other tool that you can get. So it's, it's just a great it's a great way to learn the technique uh, of full extension and being able to go through that full range of motion. It, I don't know any other uh, tool that provides that kind of support. No, it literally, a ball is curved. And so when you lay on a ball and if you allow, if you start to figure out like, oh, okay, this is how my spine should articulate so I can work the abs through its full range of motion. You, If you allow and you keep your hips up, if you allow your spine to arch over the ball and then crunch again over the ball while maintaining hip position up at the top, you are working your abs 
through a full range of motion. And if, I'm, I'm telling you right now, eight out of 10 of you listening, if you do this right, you'll find yourself shaking. You'll find that you can only do six to 10 proper reps. I mean, my go-to ab building exercise till this day is a physio ball crunch with my arms extended over my head. It's known as a long lever crunch. It's got a lot of resistance. Mm-hmm. I can do maybe 10 or 12 when I really, really do it right. And they just build my abs. And all I need is a basic physio ball that you could buy yeah, the, anywhere. The caveat to that, though, is that you do need to have really good form. Yes. You know, in, in the program, you do a really good job of breaking the detail down on all the things that you need to be thinking about. It's a, one of those exercises where, like the plank, someone sees it and they try and emulate it and they completely mess it up. Totally. Because there are a lot of little nuances that they're not hard. They just, you need to understand it and you need to be cued it. And once you get the cues down and you and you focus on it, it can become, in my opinion too, the one of the best movements that you can do. But how you do it is so important. How you do it, it, it That's everything. is the difference between working your hip flexors and not getting much core activation and kind of wasting your time. Uh, between that and really getting an effective core muscle building workout where you could start to see the abs develop, where you could see them at higher body fat percentages like we've been talking about. That's how important uh, form is. So kind of to sum things up, okay? You know, If you're training your core right now, one of the best things you could do is phase your workouts. Include some higher resistance type exercises where you're doing six to 10 reps. Those will build your core, of course, perfect, perfect form. Then throw in some phases with some higher reps. Higher reps aren't bad, just like lower reps aren't bad, but if all you ever do are one or the other, then they start to lose their value. So you definitely want to phase your workouts. You pro- If you really want to develop your core and you want to get it there in a, in a faster uh, you know, way of doing it, train your core about three days a week, throw some trigger, trigger sessions on the side. And if you want more structure, if you want to follow a, a program, now I created this program back in, I think Doug said 2014. So if you want to see the 2014 version of Sal and see why <laughs> yeah. I talk about you know uh, aging and dog years, you get to see a young version of myself. But um, I, I created that program 2014. The original videos are in there. In fact, I filmed it in my personal training studio. This is back when um, I used to have a personal training isn't studio. It the o- isn't it the only program, Doug, that we still have that actually has old, the original videos? It's the only one that we have not. But a lot of that is because it's still so damn good. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, a lot of the other ones needed the, the mm-hmm. facelift really bad, but the, the that program is still, it's still awesome. Yeah, it still holds today. And yeah. I, I instruct throughout the program. So rather than you know watching someone do it with bullet points, I'm actually teaching you as a trainer would teach you. I think that's really important, especially with working the core. Um, again, it's in my old personal training studio. To follow this particular program, you just need something you can hang off of. So it can be a pull-up bar or something you can hang off of, uh, a physio ball and resistance bands because I do include rotational exercises for uh, the obliques. Um, it's called the No BS Six Pack Formula, and uh, we've had it since the first days of Mind Pump. And again, it's one of our more popular program. And I think because we're doing this episode right now and because so many people are stuck at home, uh, we'll make that program half off, which makes it very inex- it's a very inexpensive program. Now, something I don't remember if this is in there. It, it, let me know if it is. If it's not, I do think it's, it's something that somebody should go look at on our YouTube channel. It was one of the first uh, viral or more popular videos that we ever did was your hip flexor deactivator. Yes, that's mm-hmm. in our YouTube channel. I'm oh god, I'm so glad you brought that up. So that's if you have a lot of trouble uh, with your hip flexors totally taking over. Um, or just a, have a hard. Just if you're somebody who has a hard time feeling in your abs, yes, that's, yeah. you, this is this is the video for you. It's an exercise that is, it'll deactivate your ab, your 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 hip flexors and teach you how to feel things in your core. It's not the best muscle building core exercise. It's one that helps you connect so that you can do the ones that help. Uh, you know, yeah, build you gotta abs. learn the technique. That's a great start. It, totally. And again, we're gonna we'll put it half off, which makes it literally it's a twenty eight dollar and fifty cents program. So it's super inexpensive. It's a full ab and core workout. Uh, it's at nobs6pack.com. So that's N O B S, the number six, P A C K.com. And then if you use the code nobs50, that's N O B S 50, then you'll get the 50% off. Um, and also, uh, you can go to mindpumpfree.com. We got lots of free guides there, cost nothing. And if you want to find us all on Instagram, you can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.